Warning, content not suitable for children. Listener discretion advised, yo. 2020, yo. It's been a fucked up ass year. And I'm pretty sure I don't have to mention what's happened. I'm pretty sure you're just fucking sick of hearing it. This and that and, you know, the media, social media every fucking day, all day. So, fuck that. I ain't going to mention what happened. So, but politics, yo, election year, very important for some, right? And, um, but how far will these politicians go to get elected, to get what they want? You think they'll murder innocent people? Maybe, maybe not, right? And well, if it's not as obvious here in the United States, it definitely does happen in other countries all the time. Not saying it doesn't happen here, but it's just more obvious. But um, anywho, here's a little bit of story of um, a little bit of examples of that. So let's start with the Archives of Terror. All right. It's pretty much the introduction to Operation Condor. And I'll get to that. Hey, you got this great idea for a podcast? You think it'll do very well? Maybe you're right, but you have no idea how to start it, right? Maybe you don't have access to a computer, maybe programs, you know, it could be pretty complicated, right? Well, guess what? You don't have to. All you have to do is just go to anchor.fm slash start. That's it. Or get the app. It'll do everything for you. You have all the tools And guess what? It's free. Yeah, that's right. It's free. And you get paid for it. Boom. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. So go to anchor.fm slash start. And boom, you're welcome. So um, I look forward to hearing uh, your podcast. Uh, Please jump on in and join us. Join me in this vast community of podcasters. Great. Thanks. Screaming Chewing Show, your source of entertainment and overall fuckery. And it starts now. So, on December 22nd, 1992, former school teacher Martin Almada discovered thousands of documents that detailed the systematic repression of Paraguayans under the government of dictator General Alfredo Stresner. Almada stumbled upon what has to become known as Paraguay's Archives of Terror in the basement of a police station in the capital city of Asuncion, Asuncion, some shit, my bad, you know I always butcher these names, yo, I'm fucking horrible at this, <clears throat> anywho, while working with a judge, Jose Fernandez, to find the police records to Almada's own four-year ordeal as a political prisoner, approximately four to five tons of paperwork, yeah, a total of 700,000 papers, and microfilm pages filled the room from floor to ceiling. Not only did they describe in graphic detail the kidnapping, interrogation, and imprisonment of political prisoners, but they also finally proved hard proof of Operation Condor. Operation Condor took place approximately between the mid-1970s to the early 1980s. The military governments of Argentina, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay conspired to 
the plans of man and woman that they consider to be subversive elements within their borders. The operation was initially supposed to be about removing communist influence, but quickly became a tool to remove anyone the government bodies deemed subversive for whatever reason. Operation Condor, Condor created an agreement where each of the member countries could pursue any person or persons that they believed to be subversive into another of the member countries without fear of causing an international incident. In fact, the countries worked together to detain, torture, or even kill subversives who crossed over their borders. Using the broad term subversive in Operation Condor allowed the dictators to apply the term to more than just guerrilla fighters or communists. That meant anyone who questioned the, the status quo or offered even the slightest opposition to the regime or the regime. Members of the media, former and current legislators, union representatives, and even teachers could be arrested or kidnapped. Those men and women then faced interrogation, torture, confinement, and even the possibility of death, sometimes via death flights, where the condemned were simply flown out to sea and then tossed alive out of the plane or helicopter to plunge down into the ocean. Needless to say, a number of these individuals disappeared without a trace, though their known instance of some of the bodies washing up on shore. Damn. Started off strong on this one, right? Went straight to the fucking good shit, right? So, Martin Almada, the man who discovered the Archives of Terror, experienced Operation Condor firsthand. He was working as an elementary school principal in Paraguay when the military took him from his home in November of 1974. After being seen by a military tribunal with representatives from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay, and being accused of working as an intellectual, intellectual terrorist, Almada was tortured. So there's a quote from him. Uh, they tortured me for 30 days. For the, for the first 10 days, they would call my wife and make her listen to me cry to hear my screams as I pleaded for help. On the ninth day, they sent her my blood-soaked clothes. Yeah, the fuck, yo? As was customary in those days, it was customary to first pull off the nails, then cut off an ear, then cut out the tongue. They just kept cutting. Wow, sounds like uh, Reservoir Dogs, right? When he went a little fucking happy with that straight edge razor. But even more fucked up, right? He just kept going, yo. At least that guy, Mr. Blonde, at least he stopped at the ear, yo. Anywho, moving on. Almada, who was president of an education association that vocally opposed the ruling dictatorship at the time, committed the quote-unquote crimes of instituting a liberation education in high school, helping to build houses for poor teachers and defending a PhD dissertation that claimed the education system in Paraguay only benefited the upper class. In short, his actions showed where and how Stroessner's regime, or regime, whatever, <laughs> my bad, was failing and he wasn't keeping silent about it. Yeah, people, that's what happens when you speak up in other countries. Uh huh. They don't have that right like we do in the US. When you can say, fuck this guy, fuck that guy, fuck the government. See, I'm saying it right now and it's recorded, yo. Hopefully, I don't get black bagged. <laughs> Anywho, yeah. So, other countries, people ain't spoiled like us, yo. And that's what happens. So, Operation Condor took place within the larger conflict of the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The United States had an interest in keeping communism 
out of the Western Hemisphere. So they cultivated relationships among the dictators and military regimes holding power in South America, with some evidence that it was the CIA that helped set up specialized telecommunication systems between the governments, among other types, types of support to help facilitate the removal of communism, quote unquote, subversives in these nations. As U.S. General Robert W. Porter stated in 1968, a few years before Operation Condor got underway, quote, quote unquote, in order to facilitate the coordinated employment of internal security forces within and among Latin American countries, we are in de devouring to foster inner service and regional cooperation by assisting in the organization of integrated command and control centers, the established of common operation operating procedures and the conduct of joint and combined training exercises, end quote. Beyond this, political science professor and author of Predatory States, which detailed the United States involvement in Operation Condor, J. Patrice McSherry, McSherry, noted there is a increasingly weighty evidence suggesting that the U.S. military and intelligence officials supported and collaborated with Condor as a secret partner or sponsor. A recently declassified document from the U.S. Department of State known as the, oh fuck, I'm going to fucking butcher this, yo, <laughs> my bad, I apologize in advance, but, <laughs> okay, here we go, Chuy. Schlaudemann Memorandum, okay, S-H-L-A-U-D-E-M-A-N, okay, Schlaudemann Memorandum, it sounds like I made it up, don't it, <laughs> I did, I promise, also shows that the United States understood the government's position, noting that this siege mentality shading into paranoia is perhaps the natural result of the convulsions of recent years in which the societies of Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina have been badly shaken by assault from the extreme left. They also noted that the problem begins with the definition of subversion. Yeah, there's that word again. Never the most precise of terms, one reporter writes that subversion has grown to include nearly anyone who opposes government policy. Yeah, that's right. Want me to repeat that? <laughs> has grown to include nearly anyone who opposes government policy. Yeah. In countries where everyone knows that the subversives can wind up dead or tortured, educated people have an understandable concern about the boundaries of dissent. The Schlaundemann Memorandum also mentions rumors that Argentina's police murdered Uruguayan's refugees as a favor to Uruguay. Though it isn't known how much merit there is to these accusations. Today, the archives of terror given it an ample and well-documented proof of atrocities to survivors, their families, and the families of the missing. Such evidence played heavily in the plaintiff's favor when a group of former political prisoners decided to sue police officials whom they claimed tortured them during interrogations. The defendant's initial response of having no idea who the plaintiffs were crumbled when the archives were discovered and the transcripts of the interrogations contained the names of every plaintiff present. All in all, Operation Condor is thought to have resulted in something on the order of 300,000 to 500,000 people arrested and imprisoned. About 30,000 people having disappeared, some perhaps killed while others secretly fled to other nations, an estimated 50,000 to 60,000 or so people killed. 
Yeah, what the fuck, yo? So, that was the Archives of Terror. And if you ask me, it's pretty fucking terrorizing, yo. So, moving on. Right? You want to know more details? You're like, what the fuck, yo? Want to know more about Operation Condor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I got you. Just stay tuned. So, Operation Condor. It was an organized program of state-sponsored murder in which U.S.-backed regimes conspired to hunt down, kidnap, and kill political opponents across South America and beyond. Operation Condor. It was an organized program of state-sponsored murder in which U.S.-backed regimes conspired to hunt down, kidnap, and kill political opponents across South America and beyond. Operation Condor, named after the world's largest carry-on bird, was devised to eliminate thousands of exiled left-wing activists who had dared confront the military dictators who ruled the continent in 1970s and 80s. 18 former military officers, including Argentina's last dictator, Reynaldo Bignon, 88, will on Friday be sentenced on charges including kidnapping, torture, and forced disappearance. Seven other defendants, including George Videla, the general who headed Argentina's junta during its bloodiest first three years, have died since the trial began in 2013. Now, this article is uh, like three years old, so just heads up in case you're like, what the fuck, Chewy? Living in the past, yo. So, the court has heard evidence on the deaths of more than 100 left-wing activists uh, allegedly killed in Argentina, including 45 Uruguayans, 22 Chileans, 15 Paraguayans, and 13 Bolivians. If the judges accept the thesis presented by the plaintiffs, many of them represented by the human right group CELS, S-E-L-S, Center for Legal and Social Studies in Argentina, it will be the first time the existence of murderous multi-nation plan is proven in a court. Fucking crazy, yo. The verdict is also likely to cast a fresh light on allegations that the operation was backed by the CIA and at least tactically approved by the then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. The plaintiffs alleged that the Operation Condor received support from the U.S., especially in the form of its communication system, which they say operated through Condortel, a U.S. telex system based in Panama. Gaston Chilier, the executive director of CEL, said, what we found among the large amount of documents we presented as evidence is that the U.S. definitely had knowledge of the existence of the operation and even provided a communication station in Panama for the intelligence services of the six nations involved to communicate with each other via telex. Yo, why didn't they just make a WhatsApp group, right? WhatsApp. <laughs> or Snapchat group. According to secret documents unearthed after democracy returned to the region, Operation Condor was originally drawn up at a secret 1975 meeting of intelligence chiefs from Argentina, Argentina Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and later expanded to include Brazil. The minutes of the meetings were signed for Chile by Colonel Manuel Contreras, the dreaded head of that country's Dina secret police. Its purpose was to allow cooperating countries to send death squads into each other's territory and sometimes further afield to monitor, kidnap, or kill political exiles. While some individual crimes committed during the Operation Condor have been the subject of previous trials, Friday's verdict will focus on a participation in the plan itself, said Chilier. 
What distinguishes this trial from other cases involving isolated crimes committed by Operation Condor is that the defendants now face being condemned for being members of an illegal association, he said. Among those who will be paying close attention to Friday's verdict is Eddie Binstock, whose then wife, Monica Pinus de Binstock, a young Argentinian member of the Montaneros urban guerrilla group, was captured by Brazilian security forces when her plane landed in Rio de Janeiro in March 1980. She was from flying from Panama and had called me by phone the day before to arrange where we would meet in Rio. We had both escaped from Argentina because our lives were in danger there, Binstock told the Guardian. I waited and waited and she never showed up. It was when a batch of U.S. documents from the period were declassified in 2002 that Binstock was able to discover his wife's fate. Oh man, that's fucked up, yo. You gotta wait till U.S. documents are declassified, then you find out what happened to your wife. No bueno, yo. No bueno. What is the most dangerous book you have ever read? How about Mein Kampf by the notorious leader of the Nazis, Adolf Hitler? Or the book the Beatles warn us about in their classic song, Revolution? Quotations from Chinese Communist leader, Chairman Mao. Maybe you would hide your copy of Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian. Or even semi-fictional works like Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. That book had him living in hiding from angry Muhammad followers. But what about a book that is most likely not only dangerous to own and read, but could very well be illegal in many countries? Roderick Edwards' book, How to Overthrow Our Government, takes the reader on a historical and hypothetical journey of revolution, civil war, and sedition. From ancient Chinese farmers turning their farm tools into weapons, to the attempted impeachment of the U.S. President Trump, this book has it all. Get it today before it's banned forever. One of the documents mentioned her by name relating a conversation between an Argentinian military officer and a U.S. diplomat at the time, with the officer saying how an Argentinian military plane had flown especially to Galeo Airport in Rio to pick her up and bring her to Buenos Aires, from where she was taken to Campo de Mayo Army Facility, which at the time operated as a death camp. Yep, you know what's coming, guys. Binstock has still not been able to find out what happened to his wife after she was taken to Campo de Mayo. The Camp of May. That's a weird name for a death camp, right? Another case involved a young Uruguayan couple, Maria Gatti and Jorge Zaffaroni who in 1975 fled to neighboring Argentina, at the time still under democratic rule. After Argentina's 1976 coup, the couple and their infant daughter Mariana were kidnapped by Uruguayan agents and taken to Automotores Orleti, a converted mechanics garage that served as the Operation Condor headquarters in Buenos Aires. <laughs> the fuck you? That's like a perfect fucking cover up for a fucking headquarters, yo. A mechanic shop. They're probably, probably playing like Mexican music. They have guys outside with the car hood up. They're just banging on shit, making noise. <laughs> Beer cans all over the place, yeah. Sounds like a good place. Anywho, the couple were murdered and their child, then just one year old, was given to intelligence officer Miguel Angel Fursi to raise as his own. The fuck, yo, that's some fucking novella shit, bro. That's some fucking, for real, man, some Mexican soap opera. Yo, this needs to be a novella, yo, for real. It's fucked up. People died. But still, yo, 
Mariana Safaroni was eventually reunited with her biological family in 1992, and Fursi was sentenced for her kidnapping the following year. Fursi is now also among the defendants to be sentenced on Friday on 67 counts of quote-unquote disappearances and tortured at Orleti. The impact of Operation Condor was not limited to Latin America. One of the most dramatic episodes took place in Washington, D.C., yo. Oh, shit, man. 1976, Orlando Letelier, Chile's former defense and foreign minister under President Salvador Allende, was killed by a car bomb that detonated in front of the Irish embassy in Sheridan Circle. U.S. intelligence documents declassified last year show that the order to kill Letelier had come directly from the dictator General Augusto Pinochet. <laughs> that's I think that's how you fucking pronounce it. I don't know. Declassified State Department records show that the month before Letelier's murder, Kissinger had ordered U.S. ambassadors posted to the six Condor countries to express Washington's quote-unquote deep concern at the po possible assassination of politicians and prominent figures in South America and beyond. The ambassadors, fearful to raise the topic with their host, demurred, suggesting that it would be safer to approach the South American ambassadors posted in Washington instead. But Kissinger rescinded the order on September 16th, just five days before Letterlier's murder, instructing that no further action should be taken on this matter. So there you have it, folks. The Archives of Terror and Operation Condor. Now, even though it was creepy and some fucked up shit, it's not really a mystery, right? Since uh, the facts came out and everybody now knows what what is up with that. But uh, let me give you a short little mystery. I love this one. This is uh, about D.B. Cooper. And it's still a mystery today that has not been solved. It involves robbery and getting away from the CIA or FBI. Yeah. Has never been found again. There's conspiracies of... Maybe he has been found or he died. I mean, this was like in the 70s. So he probably dead now. So yeah, this topic was actually brought up to me by a listener and a band member. Um, he's in the band Observer Syndrome. Yeah, shout out to you guys. Badass mofo. Punk band. Uh, played one of their songs in episode 33. How to Overthrow a Government. Uh, their song was Dynamite in the Well. Go check them out. Yeah. So, here's D.B. Cooper, y'all. It's the only unsolved hijacking case in the history of commercial aviation. On the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, Thanksgiving Eve, a man aboard a flight from Portland to Seattle threatened to detonate a bomb if he didn't receive a hefty ransom. Once he got the money, the hijacker released all passengers and ordered the crew to fly to Mexico and route with the cash in hand, the man parachuted from the aircraft. Yeah, some Mission Impossible shit right there, yo. This man was known as D.B. Cooper. After a 45-year FBI investigation, his identity, whereabouts, and motive remain unknown. No one even knows whether he survived the jump and one of the prime suspects died in 2019. The FBI's extensive record on D.B. Cooper described him as a white male, 6 foot 1 tall, 170 to 175 pounds, uh, age mid 40s, olive complexion, brown eyes, black hair, conventional haircut, parted on left, Cooper boarded Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305. He settled in his aisle seat at the rear of, of the 727, lit a cigarette, and ordered a bourbon and soda. Oh, he a classy man. Then he handed a note to the Florence Schaffner. 
a 23-year-old flight attendant. I have a bomb in my briefcase. It read, I want you to sit next to me. Oh, he just wanted a friend. Schaffner did as instructed. Cooper told her the rest of his demands. $200,000 and four parachutes delivered on landing at SeaTac Airport. While police and airline staff on the ground scrambled to assemble the money and chutes, the pilots flew in circles above Seattle. Passengers were told that a minor mechanical issue had forced the plane to burn fuel, prolonging a flight that would normally take 30 minutes. After three and a half hours in the air, the 727 finally landed, having received his money and parachutes. Cooper dismissed all 36 passengers and two of the six crew members. The plane refueled and took off for Cooper's next requested destination. Oh yeah, going on vacation, Mexico, via Reno and Yuma to refuel. During the first leg with the crew in the cockpit, Cooper lowered the rear stairs and parachuted into a thunderstorm. Damn that. That sounds epic as fuck, yo. And he has never been found. What the fuck? Yeah. Oh, no, man. I, I think that's so fucking cool, yo. This motherfucker hijacked the plane, got his money, and jumped out of a fucking plane into a thunderstorm. Yo. Cooper, you a badass mofo, yo. The FBI followed thousands of leads to find Cooper, considering more than 800 suspects in the five years following the incident. Below are some men who have been considered suspects. Richard McCoy Jr. On April 7, 1972, a man traveling under a fake name boarded a new Newark. What the fuck? N E W A. I never heard about that. My bad. Newark, Los Angeles flight. Shortly after takeoff, he handed a note to one of the flight attendants. The note demanded $500,000 in cash and four parachutes. If these were not furnished, the man, a seasoned skydiver and helicopter pilot, would bomb the plane. The 727 landed and refueled the hijacker exchange passengers for cash and parachutes and en route to next destination jumped from the rear stairs to freedom sound familiar deja vu anybody this hijacking occurred less than five months after db cooper incident leading many to suspect that the same culprit might have been responsible yeah makes sense the perpetrator of the april crime richard mccoy jr was convicted of air piracy and received a 45-year prison sentence. On August 10, 1974, however, he and some fellow inmates hijacked a garage truck and escaped their Pennsylvania penitentiary. When the FBI finally tracked McCoy down in Virginia three months later, a shootout left him dead. God damn, that was fucking epic. Wow, dude, that was epic as fuck. Shit, man. That's some Grand Theft Auto shit. Straight up, yo. All right. Next guy. Robert Rackstraw. Back in the 1970s, pilot and former paratrooper Robert Rackstraw had a whole lot going on. Grand Theft, $75,000 worth of bad checks, and the possible murder of his stepfather were just a few of his infractions, which authorities nabbed him. After being acquitted of the murder charge, Rackstraw saw fit to fake his own death in 1978 by logging a false mayday call from a rented plane in Northern California. He spent two years in prison for a check fraud and theft on, of an aircraft. In the 2016 book, The Last Master Outlaw, authors Thomas J. Colbert and Tom Slossi presented evidence gathering during a five-year investigation into Rackstraw's past. They concluded he was the legendary hijacker, a claim Rackstraw's lawyer called the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Rackstraw died from a heart condition on July 9th, 2019. 
next guy, Kenneth Christensen. Kenneth Christensen had a more direct link to the Cooper incident. He had worked for the Northwest, the hijacked airline as a mechanic, flight attendant, and purser. Kenneth's brother, Lyle, what the fuck, Lyle, claims that when Kenneth was on his deathbed in 1994, he said, there's something you should know, but I cannot tell you. Kenneth had been a military paratrooper the year after the D.B. Cooper hijacking. Despite being on a modest flight attendant's salary, he bought a house in cash. Huh? Uh, I'm not convinced. Clues in the D.B. Cooper case. Cannily, Cooper had taken his ransom note back from the flight attendant, so investigators were unable to examine it. Smart guy. Cooper did leave a few traces behind though, some cigarette butts, a hair on the headrest of his seat and clip-on necktie, which he tore from his collar be- before hur- hurling himself from the plane. Unfortunately, the FBI could not get any fingerprints from the items, though it was initially believed that Cooper was a battle-scarred skydiver, perhaps a paratrooper. Further analysts found that he was likely no expert. No experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night in the rain with a 200 mile an hour wind in his face. Wearing loafers and a trench coat, said FBI Special Agent Larry Carr in 2007. Investigators also thought Cooper acted alone. If he had worked with with an accomplice, he would have requested a much more specific flight path rather than saying, fly to Mexico. You boys like Mexico? And jumping out when visibly was visibility was poor. In 1980, a child's discovery reignited interest in the mystery. Eight-year-old Brian Ingram was digging in the sand on the banks of Washington's Columbia River when he found a bundle of rotting $20 bills totaling $5,800. When his parents contacted the police, they learned that the serial numbers on the cash matched those from the stash given to D.B. Cooper. Aside from the few items left behind on the plane, this is the only material evidence found from the hijacking. Six years after he discovered the money, Ingram was allowed to keep 2,760 of it. In 2008, he sold 15 of the fragmented $20 bills at auction for $37. I'm a fucking idiot. $37,433.38. God damn, yo. In the wake of the hijacking, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered that Cooper Vane's named after the elusive DB, must be installed in all Boeing 727 aircraft. A Cooper vane is a small latch fitted to the outside of all planes with rear stairs. The latch prevents anyone from opening the door mid a flight, just as DB Cooper did as he leapt into the air and vanished into obscurity. Yeah. So, um... That was D.B. Cooper, y'all. The crazy-ass fucking skydiving stuntman. They might have got away. Might have died. I don't know. They say he wasn't an expert because what he was wearing. And he jumped out of the plane into a storm. I don't know. Maybe what if he was a fucking badass, yo. I mean, obviously, if they found the money stashed and they traced those bills... Obviously, he got away, right? Unless he, like, fucking died and the money fell on the dirt and they got buried over time. Maybe. But, fact of the matter is, we'll never fucking know. Just up to your imagination, yo. So, but yeah. um, That's my episode for today. Some creepy shit. Some mysteries. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. But before I end this episode, I'd love to give a huge shout out to Jeremy Joyner 
Yeah, my producer, yo. Uh huh. A monthly contributor, Jeremy. You're fucking amazing, yo. And thank you again. And I will continue to thank you. And uh, if any of you would like to be a producer of mine and would get future shout outs, you can just go to anchor.fm slash screamingtweetgmail.com and just click support this podcast, yo. And, um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I uh, got another episode coming up soon. So uh, stay tuned, yo. And peace. Thanks for tuning in. And if you'd like to support this podcast, you can find me at anchor.fm slash screaming chewy gmail com. There'll be three options for a monthly subscription. First one, I believe, starts at a dollar a month, yo. Yeah, dollar a month. Yeah, and if you don't want to, that's cool. You can follow me on Facebook and YouTube, Screaming Chewy Show, for some memes, some more videos for episodes. And behind the scenes kind of deal, right? You can follow me on Twitter, uh, Screaming Chewy. Yeah, not Screaming Chewy show. I should probably change it. But it's just Screaming Chewy. And uh, thanks for listening. Peace.